Welcome to Critical Thought TV. I'm your host, Stuart Dambrot. We're here today with Dr. Aubrey de Grey, biomedical gerontologist and chief science officer at the SENS Foundation. Hi. This is a, a kind of a, a trends and challenges uh, discussion now that covers a lot of, of topics. And perhaps we could start off with uh, something that is actually an issue now and appears to be uh, becoming more of an issue uh, over the next few decades, which is uh, an aging population in the context of the future of cities. Mm -hmm. And related to that, the not just the technologies involved, but the socioeconomics of climate change, the consequence of climate change, food shortages, uh, potable water, um, and then uh, even services that may that the aging population may well need before the uh, products that sense research yields are instantiated. Well, I think you asked the question exactly correctly because for sure our role is to develop biomedical technologies that essentially obviate all of the issues that we have to think about in terms of the health and quality of life of the elderly in today's world. The world in general becomes more prosperous and countries move from developing to developed. Um, they do have more opportunity, of course, to look after their elderly better and to give more opportunities to the elderly to get around and to live a high quality life as long as possible. And this extends, as you mentioned, not only to biomedical um, uh, therapies, uh, to, to, to actual, uh, actual medical therapies, but also to the whole environment. In cities, there are many challenges just arising from proximity and arising from um, the need for people to live in high-rise apartments, things like that. So, of course, the efforts that are being made to modify and to optimize the structure of cities for that purpose, as well as to uh, address other problems that cities have been known to cause, like excessive production of greenhouse gases and so on. Ah. Um, you know, this is this is a really good thing, and and it, it, it's nice to see that efforts to um, to address the problems that the elderly have in cities are being are being undertaken in conjunction with and strong communication with efforts to address these other problems, such as oh, environmental. Right. So then the challenge overall at a certain level of abstraction would be the time period be between now and when uh, SENS uh, derivatives come online. I think uh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, let's, uh, let's turn now to something outside of uh, strict um, biomedical technology in, in terms of uh, impacts, interactions, and so on. Um, I will admit I picked this one because I'm a fan, but also I noticed you originally uh, were in artificial intelligence. That's right. And uh, I was thinking to ask you uh, uh, for your thoughts on how artificial intelligence or even more robust artificial general intelligence might be applied to discovery, molecular modeling, uh, and other forms of uh, in silico, if you will, research uh, in advance of actually committing to a SENS product. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so. I think the essence of this is that defeating aging with medicine is really hard. We don't know how to do it in detail. We're working on it as fast as we can, but um, we've got a fairly detailed plan, but there's still lots more to, to be addressed, lots more research to do. And some people think that a shortcut to doing so may be to pursue artificial general intelligence research as aggressively as possible so as to develop computers that can solve certain types of problems at least, maybe all problems, more effectively and therefore more rapidly than we can, and thereby give us some you know, leg up, some, uh, some solutions to, to these things. I'm all in favor of that. I have no idea whether it's true, whether we will actually be able to develop computers that can help us in that way before we've solved the problem for ourselves, but I sure as hell think it might be true, and therefore I'm delighted that there are people out there trying to pursue that option. I think that's great. Yeah, and it recalls, I recall... Um, uh, this was from a decade or more ago. Some of the early AI work, uh, and it had an input from uh, evolutionary programming, as I recall, but it was actually able to discover, uh, not just re recreate solutions to certain uh, difficult mathematical problems, but found alternative solutions. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I was thinking about, that in fact, uh, since molecular modeling, uh, synthetic biology, computational bio bi biology are essentially um, mathematical in nature, in many ways, not completely, mm -hmm. course, but in, in many ways, that exactly the thing you're talking about could actually give us that leg up. It may very well. I think the main barrier here is the availability of the right data. At the moment, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not just that computers aren't smart enough, it's also that what a computer can do 
is a function of what it's given to do. And so, you know, this phrase garbage in, garbage out <laughs> is something that may apply rather strongly at the moment. Um, and w what the, the main source of, um, of improved data would be, for example, from SENS research, I would imagine, well, and other, other areas as well. Well, certainly other areas. I would say, actually, that SENS research is probably not going to be the main source of the knowledge that an artificial intelligence oh. machine would use. Rather, it would be the place it's applied. Sense research is, of course, translational. We are trying to actually use knowledge that already exists to develop techniques that oh, will right. get, okay. um, that will postpone age-related ill health. But I think there's a great deal of, uh, of need still for more discovery, for more understanding of how the body works in the first place, so as to, uh, so as to help us make sure we have the right targets. Robotics, not in the sense of uh, robotics that uh, tends to say an aging population mm -hmm. as robots, uh, and that's you know that's a, that's a whole discussion about cultural differentiation and how they're accepted more, let's say, in Japan than they are here. And mm -hmm. but that's not what I'm asking about. Uh, this is more about uh, the role of robotic uh, technology in non-biological biomedical solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course Sense Foundation's research is all about applying biotechnology uh, to, to the problems of aging, about developing stem cell therapies and gene therapies and such like. Um, but there's certainly a role in addressing aging as in addressing all other aspects of ill health for looking at non-biological solutions. Mm -hmm. We're familiar with some of these already. Glasses are a non-biological solution to a, a, an important problem. Um, at the more high-tech level, we can think of cochlear implants, for example, which are used, of course, to address hearing loss in certain cases. Um, I think we are bound to see a progressive and accelerating expansion of the applica application of non-biological solutions. We're going to see artificial organs, artificial hearts are already pretty much there, things like that. But we're also going to see a lot of miniaturization. We're going to see smaller and smaller machines, and that will um, very greatly increase the versatility, the, uh, the, the number of options oh. that, 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 that are out there. Right. Now, the extreme end of that is what's called molecular manufacturing, nanotechnology where we build right. machines that are really the size of enzymes, the size of you know, small proteins, um, to, to, to perform various tasks. And in many cases, these may actually be robots in the much more you know, narrow sense. They may actually have moving parts that do particular things. There are certain very elaborate but very well-justified designs for particular functions that we might get um, these machines to do once we had good technology for actually building them in the first place. So, um, and correct me if this association is missing the mark, but it, what, what, I, uh, what occurred to me while you were saying that would, well, was going back to uh, our discussion about, um, about the telomere and uh, the cancer versus healthy cells, that uh, those types of um, endogenous uh, nanorobotics, if we're able to target specifically cancer cells and deal with that tel telomere question, and then we could have a robust extension of the telomere function in non-carcinogenic cells, non-cancer non cells. Yeah. That so, would be one such application. Very possibly, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fundamental problem that we have today in treating cancer is not that it's hard to kill cancer cells. The problem is that it's hard to kill cancer cells without killing other cells at the same right. time. The specificity. Uh, yeah, and the reason that's so hard, it's uniquely hard for cancer, is because cancer is constantly evolving. Every cell in a cancer is this furnace of genetic creativity. And and the selective pressure is for the cancer cell to find ways, if you like, to masquerade as a non-cancer cell, oh, to trick whatever the body's trying to do, or for that matter, whatever the doctor's trying to do, into not hitting the cancer cell after all. Now, I think it's very realistic to suppose that non-biological solutions, such as molecular nanotechnology, in the relatively distant future, will be able, will be much better at not being fooled at discriminating right. between cancer cells and non-cancer cells than anything that we can do today. I'm hoping that we won't have to wait that long. I'm hoping that right. our, our, our rather more primitive approaches will actually achieve the same results sooner than that. But I'm very pleased that people are trying to develop um, nanotechnological solutions to these things too. Yeah, whether it's, I mean, it could be almost anything. It's, I mean, it's a bit speculative, obviously, but it could be anything from uh, sensing chemical gradients to heat to actual uh, uh, nano-optics that can actually look for with inbuilt uh, perceptual recognition to actually visually differentiate a cancer growth. 
It's, you, that's very far future, but still. I, I would say that actually it would probably go further than that. It would probably involve these nanorobots, as people sometimes call them, actually going into cells and examining the gene expression profiles, which proteins are being that's made, fantastic. apparently, and so on, and deciding whether to kill the cell on, the, on that basis. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, the last thing that uh, I'd like to ask, and um, I don't know how we're going to briefly address this because it's a, a big topic, but would be the, um, the related uh, work in informatics uh, in terms of uh, your context, as well as how it relates to computational and synthetic biology. Sure. Computational biology is a big, big field, and much of it is irrelevant to the the, the, the goal of biomedical gerontology. But a lot of it has very broad specificity and it can be, you, can be very applicable, very relevant. Uh, protein folding is a fine example. This is one of the classic problems in um, computational biology and we're getting much better at being able to predict what three-dimensional shape a protein will have by examining uh, the way its um, primary sequence, its amino acid sequence is. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that, that's a great example. When we come to synthetic biology, what is synthetic biology? People have different definitions. Um, we can think of it really, however, as the application of engineering principles, putting components together in, way, in new creative ways to, uh, you know, to create a, a new function that biology, that evolution might not have been able to create because evolution just has fewer tools available to it. Um, Synthetic biology hasn't really demonstrated yet that it can do things that are really important, but it's still in its infancy, and I have a lot of interest in watching how it, how it develops. Okay, very good. And then let's conclude it, if you don't mind, with uh, any thoughts you might have on uh, informatics and how that's relevant to sense. So, so bioinformatics is really all about making sure that biologists have access to the data that would help them to design their next experiment and to interpret their experiments and so on. And the more data there is, the harder that is. So there's, constant, there's a constant sort of arms race between people who are generating data and people who are trying to organize it in a searchable way. That's really a very important part of the whole of biology, not just gerontology. As, as we just covered, that, that is in fact one of your primary inputs. I guess. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.